talk to us a little bit about when you started what what drove you to want to do photography that leads to taking these pictures and hip hop and these iconic photos and how does that even begin all right so i didn't set out to take pictures of hip hop i didn't set out to take pictures of the latin greats like tito puente celia cruz and you know all praise to celia cruz you know today's her anniversary of her passing I didn't set out to take pictures of, you know, demonstrations against the movie Ford Apache of the Bronx, Paul Newman. I was a young kid in the Bronx that fell in love with photography, period, end of story. I just happened to have grown up in the neighborhood in the Bronx during an era of urban decay, for lack of better words. And I had a camera. And my, my goal was to become a successful photographer and travel the world. That was my dream. Mm. It took 30 years. But, you know, I was a 10-year-old kid. And the reason why I can point to being 10, because I have a report card from, from my school, where my teacher is saying Joey's excelling in photography. And, you know, I didn't have the gift of gab. I wasn't an athletic person. I was the only kid in the neighborhood with a camera and mm -hmm. fell in love with photography. And the rest is history. I went to school with some of the pillars, the bricklayers of this culture that we love, hip hop. I was the grandson of one of the most notorious activists, the Hell Lady of the Bronx, my grandmother, Elvelina Antonetti. And I happened to have grown up in a time that, you know, the Bronx was uh, front page of uh, every newspaper and every news channel because of the urban decay and the, the burning of the Bronx. So I didn't set out to do any of all of this stuff that I'm known for today. How did you take us through the, the connection that you get with, with the Cold Crush? I went to school with Easy AD from the Cold Crush Brothers and DJ Tony Tone, co-founders of the Cold Crush Brothers. Easy AD was a uh, star basketball player at South Bronx High School. I was a high school photographer, and I was befriended by Tony Tone. You know, he was, uh, uh, you know, you know, Tony Tone never leaving the girls alone and the mm -hmm. girls never leaving Tone. Tone was a mat bag then. Mm -hmm. And I got invited one day to go take pictures of this group that they're putting together. Now, we're not talking hip hop. Hip hop wasn't even coined then. It was this group that they were putting together and this jam was happening up at the T Connection. Mm -hmm. up in the North Bronx. And my thing was, okay, I'm going to go take some pictures. Maybe I can make 20 bucks, which was a lot of money. I can get me two rolls of film. And, you know, I'm down. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that night, I'll never forget, is the night that I was kidnapped into this culture that we call hip-hop. Because seeing these two, two DJs you know, black and brown, Charlie Chase, Tony Tone, play music mm -hmm. that my parents played growing up, but played in a different way. Mm -hmm. I was just blown away. Now, mind you, I had gone to, you know, I'm 16, 15, 17 years old. Park jams had been going on for years prior to that. You know what I mean? prior to that but to be actually invited to a group that you know would later become one of the super groups of of that era and even of today i mean you have some of the biggest stars in 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 the rap game who sing and praise the cold crush brothers
the drums are from an African bloodline. Okay. You, you, you speak to, you, you hear these interviews by Mario Bausa, uh, 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 um, Patato, you know, Hilberto Santa Rosa, all these Latin greats, they'll, they'll tell you drums and that's where these break beats come from. But you got to understand something too, Derek. You know, these early DJs, Charlie Chase, Tony Tone, Flash, you know, the records that they were finding these beats from were disco records. They were looking for these beats and they found them wherever they could find them. These DJs were, were, were searching for a beat that nobody else was playing from Cool Herc to whatever. And those beats were found in every genre of music. It's obviously disco, um, there's funk, there's uh, rock, there's, um, you know, Caribbean, there's, and, and there's definitely Latin, you know, but people want to exclude the Latin part, you know, as if, it, no, that's, it's not Latin because these are African-American groups that are playing these songs. And what I'm saying is, I understand that, but what I'm saying is, there's a root. You mentioned one of the roots, which is Bausa, the Palladium. That's the, the Afro-Cuban rhythm is where these guys, um, as time went on, they wanted that sound in, in, in. They didn't set out to make break beats. They just made records that had a break in it. Chano Poso has this uh, great song, and it's one of the biggest b-boy anthems they use today. You know, you, you hear it. Manteca. Manteca, right. Manteca. I mean, we did a thousand times over, but, you know, Chano Poso and Dizzy Gillespie were, were the ones that, that put it together. And you listen to these, you know, you go to a Red Bull jam final, and they're playing Manteca. Now, you were just at, I saw you, I was watching the BC One's it, was it this year or last year? Last year's World Finals in New York. I yeah. saw you walking around and taking pictures. One of the things I noticed, in, and they didn't even use a lot of the original B-Boy anthems. They used some modern stuff. Well, but I mean, when you get into big, big corporations like Red Bull and stuff like that, they have to be careful on music that they use because it's going to be televised. So they have these phenomenal DJs like Lean Rock and, and, and you know, Cuber. They have to make up their own beats, so to speak. When I was listening, I'm like, man, most of these people, most of these, these tracks that they're playing are laced with Latin, Latin flavor, whether it's a cowbell, whether it's a conga, whether it's a timbal. You can't run away from the Latino influences, period, and a story. How far do we go back? Because they, they have a... There's well, a certain I mean, again, when did the culture start? <laughs> That's a good question. When did it start? I'm hearing all these debates that so-and-so's the first B-boy. Okay, did he just wake up one day and say, I'm going to become a B-boy? He had to be influenced by somebody. And then that somebody that influenced him had to be influenced by somebody else. You know, I didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a photographer. I was influenced by my stepdad, who was a family photographer. Okay? And so on and so on. I studied the craft in school to hone my skills. You know, Flash was influenced by somebody. Mm -hmm. Bam was influenced by somebody. Charlie Chase was influenced by somebody. When did this culture start? I know it started in the Bronx. That's most definite. Started. I know it started in the Bronx. Had little embers, you know, in different boroughs. And I know in my neighborhood... In the Bronx, 
It was nothing but blacks and Latinos. And let's sprinkle in some some Jewish people and Italian people and a handful of Asian people. Yeah. Okay. There were some neighborhoods that were predominantly black, but you had Hispanics in there. There were some neighborhoods that were predominantly Latino, but you had some black people in there. I grew up on Hump 49th Street in Morris, across the street from Little Italy on Morris Avenue. Because there was two Little Italy's, Arthur Avenue and Morris Avenue. Mm. Okay? So, you know, all of this, you know, tonteria going on, you know, they planted the seeds, we nurtured it. You know, if you want to put it that way, then, you know, we were guests. But I don't see it that way. You know, we, we all planted the seed. The Bronx planted the seed. And whoever was living in the Bronx at that time planted the seed. Mm -hmm. I don't claim to be the first hip-hop photographer. Never have. Mm -hmm. Never will. But I'm one of the only person that was taking pictures as a photographer. There's tons of pictures out there that predate my photographs. Predate my photographs. But those were by Chinito with his borrowing his cousin's 110 Instamatic camera and just happened to take a few 110 shots that day at a jam. Or Cheito, you know, you know, stole a camera from the drugstore and took some pictures. But I was taking pictures and going home and developing them in my darkroom. So that sets me apart from taking snapshots to being a photographer. How, how early do you see what came to be known as hip hop, which is New York City street culture? How early do you see this and what do you see? Well, I'm, I'm 60 years old. Mm -hmm. Born in 1963, okay? So I can remember going to, to street jams and park jams eight, nine, ten years old. So, you know, 70, 71. But nobody was calling it hip-hop. Mm -hmm. Hip-hop didn't come about until later on. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't until years later, you know, depending on what narrative you want to listen to, you know, uh, you know, this one in the army cadence, hip hop, hip hop, you know, and, you know, bam, putting it all under one umbrella. But, you know, I dabbled in a little bit of writing. I dabbled into a little bit of, you know, DJing and putting my speaker out the window until my mother took my turntable away from me, saying that she didn't buy me a turntable to play for the for for the people out in the street. Right. You know, so I mean it, I don't know if you can you can't pinpoint a precise date on this culture. You can't. And mm -hmm. I challenge anybody to do that. I would okay? never I would never try to pinpoint a date. I would pinpoint a year. And I would say that there's reasons behind that. Um, when you look, I definitely know that there is, there, there definitely are jams, there definitely are outdoor parties, there definitely are block parties happening, 70, 71, 72, 73, you know, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn. Yeah, I know that. When, when we talk about this specific culture, uh, this New York, New York City, Bronx subculture that comes about. You don't really start to see the embers of that fire burning based around everything that I've seen, based around everything that I've heard uh, from the pioneers, from people like Flash, from people like Kokla Rock, from people like, um, you know, <clears throat> Dancing Doug, from, from people that were there, practitioners would say, it, it's not 73, it's more like 75. And I happen to believe that based around what's taking place 
that year is pivotal. So that's the year that Flash introduces people to the quick mix theory at 23 Park. Um, that's the year that Herc enters the Hevelo and introduces the Herculoid sound system. That's the year Coke Rock takes Rock at the Hevelo. That's the year uh, Herc starts calling the dancers B-boys. That's the year that he comes out with the merry-go-round. It's like every that's the year that the 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 first b-boys late 74 75 start hitting the floor with what we know as the three step the four step the six step so it's it's that year is is pivotal then there's people who would say i lean more towards 77 because after the blackout it seemed like more people got more equipment pa 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 and i get that i know people who went to the 73 party with herc and um i you know i've asked them what was happening? I still haven't met anybody that went to that party. Dancing Doug was at that party. Cochlear Rock was at that party. Okay. Yeah. They were at that party. And they said there was a lot of people who said they were at that party that weren't at that party. So, and they, they described it. But I asked, at least I asked Doug. Obviously, I haven't spoken to Cochlear Rock. But I asked Doug, and he said, um, you know, and I, there's an interview actually with Dancing Doug and Herc. And they're talking about that party. And, and Herc says, yeah, you know, anybody that doesn't believe you were there, I'm saying that you were there. So, you know, I asked them on the phone one day, what was happening at that party? Was that hip hop? Were they, were they emceeing? Were they b-boying? Were they, he said, no, that, that's, that's not happening there. That doesn't happen there. That happens at, that happens at the Hebrew some would say the embers are, you know, are, are, are burning from then on. I get it. I get it. But the one thing that I really want to, you know, sort of speak to is this idea that, number one, we were guests in a house that we helped build. Number two, um, our influence is definitely there at the foundation. The foundation is the music. It is the breaks. That is the foundation of the culture of hip hop. It's the DJ and the B-boy foundation. Graph is earlier than that. So that's a different thing. We talked the other day about, you mentioned Dito Puente, you mentioned the breaks, Curtis Blow. Take us through that story of Puente getting connected and then Delgado. No, I mean, listen, you know, I, I, I'm all about absorbing history you know i'm 60 years old i'm never too old to learn anything new and i've known this for a few years because of my book and exhibitions and stuff but like not too many people know and and you know quest love you know hit me up about a year ago and he was just blown away you know tito puente played on sugar hill gang's first album 1979 1980 when it came out and if you look at the album, it says special appearance by Tito Puente. And my dad, who's the foremost historian on Latin music, Joe Conzo Sr., hit me to that and told me the story. And the story, real quickly, is that Tito Puente got a phone call from Morris Levy. Morris Levy was a notorious mob-connected Italian, Jewish, whatever, promoter, whatever, and you just didn't say no to Morris Levy back in those days. And Morris asked Tito, can you go uh, over to uh, Inglewood, New Jersey, and meet up with Sylvia Robinson? And, you know, Tito knew who Sylvia Robinson was, and, um, and they're, they're putting together an album, a rap album. Tito showed up, and my dad was there, and, you know, in walks Tito Puente, and there's these three, you know, 16, 17 years old kids, and Master G, I have a video of him speaking about that day, and it's called Sugar Hill Groove, and if you listen to the clip, Master G and, and the rest of the Sugar Hill gang, it goes, and now on Timbales is Tito Puente, and Tito Puente does this, you know, Two minute Dimbales break, and that was it. And left. 
did it in one take. That was Tito Puente's, you know, nickname. One take Tito. Mm. And left. Mm. And I just found out last night on Discog, Tito did another record for Sylvia that I just copped, and I don't know the name, but he did it in 93, and I'm waiting to get that. But, like, Jimmy Delgado, a very famous timbalero, who still plays today has a gold record because he played the, the timbales solo on the breaks by Curtis Blow. But that's just the music aspect of this culture that we love so much. But you know, what, Joe, Joe, here's the question I want to know. Why, why choose I want to say this correctly because there are there are phenomenal African American percussionists. There's no doubt about that. But why did they choose Latin percussionists to play these parts on this record? On these records, why th why Latin? You can't have any type of epic music without percussion. Say that again, but say it more nicely. Nicely. So you can't without, have any fucking music without percussion. Now say that again, but say it nicely so I can put that in the doc. <laughs> you can't have any type of music without percussion in it. Okay? Percussion, 99.9% .9 of the time, is the backbone of any type of music. Okay? Period. End of story. I might be wrong. You, you can probably prove me wrong when it comes to opera. But, you know, country music, rock and roll, jazz, it, it, percussion is in it. Percussion is in it. That's good. No, that's good. It, it's, yeah, you know, it's, it, it, and this is where, this is where, you know, my whole thing is, this is where we see this. It's not this. It's it's this. It's 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 black and brown. If if you grew up getting back to my neighborhood, my upbringing, it was always about this. The Bronx was burning. I lived at seven 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 Caldwell Avenue, one abandoned building on one side, the other building abandoned. I lived in a one-bedroom apartment, me, my, my mother, five brothers and sisters, with another woman and two other kids, okay? Do the math. Eight people living in a one-bedroom apartment, okay? And what's that joke about Puerto Ricans? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it's right. true mm -hmm. because we had to survive. And if there wasn't enough food for us to eat that night, Doña Carmen next door had a caldero of rice and beans that was able to feed us. Or Miss Smith next door had some food for us to eat. That's right. And vice versa. Those are facts. Facts. Those are yeah. Facts. We 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 were in each other's homes. We were borrowing sugar facts. from me. It's facts. Okay. Uh, Let me get into this other thing because you got me on a roll now. Go ahead. Were there name calling in between us? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Of course. Sorry. Don't say the names. We know what you're talking about. I'm out of it today, as in a sixty-year-old adult. No, I'm not. But you know what? It's still going on today. But that didn't mean we didn't love each other. Do we describe certain music from certain ethnic groups as certain things? Yes, we did. So what? Because let me tell you, every time you point a finger, you got five fingers, four fingers pointing back at you. Okay? And we had our own little tiffs in between internal with our own ethnic groups. I had I had Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Colombians, this, that, and the other, Cubans, you know. 
black American South, straight hair, nappy hair, this, that, and the other, they're all light skin, dark skin. But in my neighborhood, it was about this. Yeah. All day. I, I had a friend who, his name was Bino. He was, he was my, one of my best friends. African-American, um, always in my home. I'm in his house. And we were best friends. Every time you saw me, you saw him. All the time. Fist fights. We fought all the time. As soon as the fight was over, it was over a comic book. It was over a, a baseball card. It was, um, we're back in each other's homes eating dinner. And, and the, that's how it was. You know, one of the things growing up in the Bronx um, that, I, that I would hear, this is the 70s, and, and, and it was happening in the 60s too, but this is the 70s, and one of the things I heard all the time was the sound of the congas. Everywhere you listened, whether it's outside on the corner, whether it's a speaker blaring, whether it's parks that you're driving by, you heard the, the wang wang ko and dudes rocking. So music is free to everybody. Everybody wanted to be a musician, whether you were black, white, Latino, this, that, and the other. The, founda the foundational instrument of music is the drums. So you walk from one corner to another, you see a jam session on a corner with a guy's bunch of guys playing congueros. And they were black, brown, even white. Even white. I grew up across the street from St. Mary's Park. DJ AJ grew up in my same building. Okay? Uh, case one. You know, one on Jeff, one of the most famous graffiti writers in the world. We all grew up in the same Jackson projects. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, again, this culture we're, we're talking about doesn't discriminate where you're from, what color skin you are. It doesn't discriminate. Right. But yet there's forces out there that are trying to divide us divide us there's forces out there that are trying to divide us that weren't even there that weren't even there and that's True. the sad part and what's even sadder is checks are being written to hear people speak to hear people speak because that's their only source of income. Mm. I'm good. I did 27 years with, with the uh, New York City Fire Department. Saving lives, delivering babies. Because I couldn't make it as a photographer. I needed, you know, a nine to five job. I needed health insurance. I needed a pension. I needed that. But I never gave up my dream as a photographer. That's good. No, but that's... those outside forces, and we're allowing that. At least some people are allowing these outside forces. And why now? Why now? Why now? I why, don't why? know why now. I don't know why now because... Because we're celebrating this so-called 50th anniversary. And let me put it out there to be totally transparent. Have I been getting paid this last year? You damn skippy I have. Mama didn't raise no fool. Because I have some of the earliest images, okay, of the culture. But I have the most phenomenal relationship with everybody that I've ever taken pictures of that I put money into their pocket and vice versa. I've never denied my images to anybody. So we all eat. 
Mm-hmm. I'm not just eating myself. We all eat. Yeah, and, and, and to make it clear, you're, and I know you're not the only one, but your photo library is has one of the richest visuals of early hip hop that we can trace that that when, when you began has one of the, the richest early visuals. And, and I often think about this and, and me and somebody were talking about this the other day. We were saying, if Joe Conzo had not taken these images, we would not have a visual record. You, get- you would. No, Derek, you know, not, yeah, there would be a, a different visual record. Okay. Right. You a had different the- visual record because Bill Adler who everybody should know calls me one of if not the greatest hip hop photographer because I came from within the culture and not the outside of the culture not to take away from anybody else that was documenting I'm wearing a shirt with you know all these different names Ahern, Conzo, Cooper and this and the other phenomenal phenomenal documentarian photographers right whose right. archives are just Mind blowing, but we all have have our lane, right? I'm more of a performance based photographer from back in the days. That's why you see a lot of the Cold Crush performing, you know, uh, Fearless Four, you know, all those guys performing. Martha Cooper is more graffiti, you know. Same thing with Charlie Ahern, you know, and it just. You know, we all have our lane and we all love each other. We all respect each other. So, I mean, if you took away all my images, there'd be a different narrative. But let's say, let's say, Joe, that you took away everybody okay. that you mentioned. So let's, let's take away all of Joe Conzo's images right now, the hip hop images. Okay. You would not have some of the earliest images of performance of groups of hip hop groups performing you would not that's right you would not you know i had a conversation i I just came back from holland i was out there with a few uh old school groups okay and they were like joe in hindsight i wish we had our own photographer like the cold crush brothers did Mm. i mean this is i'm out there with some Sugar Hill Gang, mm-hmm. Soul Sonic Force. And they're like, Joe, we didn't have the foresight to have our own photographer. That's right. Cold Crush did. Cold Crush had the foresight to have Tape Master, un Puerto Ricano, Elvis Moreno, may he rest in peace, record all the jams. And that's all the recordings we hear today. The original tape master. We had Joe Conzo, aka Joey Kane at the time, taking pictures of all the jams. But if don't you hate, don't if you the elements, the graph element, you know, if if they wouldn't have taken those pictures. I mean, in hindsight, I wish I did take more pictures of graph. Mm. In hindsight, I wish I did take more pictures of the B-Boys and the B-Girls. You know, in some of my pictures, you see a young crazy leg standing on the background watching Charlie Chase at the grills. You see, in some of my pictures, you'll see days and crash work, early works in the background. That's not what I was into. I was taking pictures of the, I was part of the band. So you went, so you were at the grill. I was at the grills. I was at the T connection. I was at the ecstasy garage. I was at the Hevelo. I was at your spot. I was at the Burger King spots that they, you know, when Burger King closed at, at 10 o'clock at night, you know, they were, would allow promoters to do jams in there. You know, I was at all the places at the grills, Roseland, you know, uh, uh, the Roxy. I was all 
all of the places. Bronx wow. River projects, mm. Zulu Nation anniversaries. Mm. Yeah. It is what it is. It is, it what, is it what it is, you know, and that was my lane. In hindsight, as an older viejo right now, if I could go back, mm -hmm. I would have taken more pictures of this, that, and the other, but there's not one single photographer that can claim that they shot all elements. No. No. Right. Okay? Right. And it's then, you know, then later on, you had these, you know, magazines, Word Up magazine, who, you know, their main photographer was Ernie Panicoli. You know, a Native American Indian with Latin roots, you know, who photographed some of the greats when they were unknown. Mm. That's right. You know, Jamel Shabazz, who doesn't consider himself a hip-hop photographer, but, you know, documented, you know, hip-hop fashion, so to speak, all throughout Brooklyn. When I watch, when I, when I look at his books and his images, the stories that, you know, you got, you got the fashion, you got the poses, you got everybody, you know, doing the poses and that, that, and that's what he's known for. And that's why he, he's so famous and, and travels the world because he captured a moment. And that's how I look at my photography, even till today to capture a moment to, and, and hopefully transport somebody back into time. What are you, fo what are you photographing these days? I'm still shooting jams, hip hop festivals, rock the bells, uh, you know, tools of war. I mean, the uh, Quatona Park jams, tools of war jams. You know, I'm still going to events, Red Bull. You know, whenever I can shoot, I'm I'm, I'm shooting, and 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 you don't have to be a marquee person for me to shoot you. You can be an up and coming new artist trying to break in a new b-boy trying to you know make his mark on, on the scene you know i was doing the graffiti hall of fame you know rest in peace tracy 168 who by the way is puerto rican that's right For people out there that don't know that's right yeah, I got a, I got a story. I got a story since with Tracy. I got a story. I got a story. Love so Tracy, you know, so I would shoot Tracy and and is the Wiz and you know Scene and PJ and all those guys who mm -hmm. don't subscribe to you know being one of the elements of 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 right. the culture, right? But you know that's another interview, but. I, um, Remember, let me tell you a quick story of Tracy. I remember we we all gathered together. This is the eighties, and it might have been eighty two, eighty three, and we're we all go down to the Villa Feast in the Bronx, and and we get there, and uh, there's Tracy, and he got his little booth, and so I went, and uh, he turns around, he looks at me, and I don't know why he did this, but <clears throat> he turns around, he looks at me. And he says, you want a shirt? And I'm like, I don't have no money. He's like, what's your name? So I told him my name, my nickname. And uh, he just, he starts with the airbrush. And he does this famous face that he does with the goggles, right? And I didn't keep the shirt. I don't have the shirt today. But who knew, right? Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? But yeah, shout out to Tracy168. Yeah. You know, foundational, you know, wild graphic. styles. Wild style. That's right. That's right. Man, good stuff. So, bro. you know, I still shoot. I still shoot, you know, as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. what I shoot today will become uh, relevant in a few years from now. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, you know, that's how I shoot. I, I, I respect who I shoot, who I take pictures of. You don't want your picture taken. 
it's fine with me. You won't be in my next book, you know, but, um, I respect, you have to respect the subject of your shooting. It is totally different today shooting today than it was 20, 30 years ago. You know, I can walk down the block. There can be a fire hydrant open and kids playing in it. Got my camera and I'm getting questioned by the parents, rightfully so. Why are you taking pictures of my kids and this, that, and the other? And, you know, you do the two-minute little, you know, Take out your phone, Google me. Oh, you're Joe Conzo. It's all good. And, you know, rightfully so. You know, you don't know where these pictures are going to end up at. But, you know, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. You know, these big festivals, they only allow a certain amount of photographers. And they put you in a pit. And, you know, you're only allowed to take, you know, first three songs. And they shuffle you off like cattle and... You know, I'm not into that. If I can't shoot the way I've always shot, I won't shoot your event. And I need a, a leave me alone Joe Conzo pass to shoot, meaning front stage, backstage, side stage, green room, back room, bathroom, wherever I want to take my camera. You know, my work has been described as the fly on the wall. Mm. You don't know I'm there taking pictures. Yeah. And that's why people respect me so much from were the you at the flash event excuse me were you at the yankee stadium flash event not no, the oh i i was I, I had i had a show out in montauk but i just wanted to be out of the bronx i didn't want to be i didn't want to be nowhere near the bronx but my mm. pictures were shown on the jumbo jumbotron during the event because my brother fat joe hit me up and said joe this is what I'm doing for my 15 minutes of, you know, performance. I'm bringing out legs. I'm bringing out so-and-so, this, that, and the other. And I want to use your images on the Jumbotron. And if you look at the videos, there goes my images, Yankee Stadium, Jumbotron, during Fat Joe's, you know, 15, 20-minute set and his guests. Yeah. And that's respect. Yeah. And I respect that. Yeah, no. It was it was a beautiful moment, um, you know, um, to see that. I saw that. I noticed that, and I'm like, wow, like so many people. You know, there's a, there's a there's an image that has gone around, and it's an image of K. Slay and. G Man Gordon Fernandez, who was a DJ with K Slay. It's a right. famous. That Henry Chalfant took that picture. It's in okay. the playground. Yes. And you see the table. You see that. That's a very famous Henry Chalfant picture. That's Henry's. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. View G Man. Yes. And this stuff is put in all these. And, and nobody knew who he was. And we connected. And he's like, nobody even knows that's me. They thought that was Herc. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny, you know, all these books that come out and they license my images and stuff, and you know, I see other images and I'm like, that's wrong. Oh, what do you mean it's wrong? I go, that's so and so, and that's so and so. Oh, but we got a, I'm telling you, that's Rock Raider, you know, from Melrose Projects. Mm. But isn't that Rob Swift, I go, no, that's Rock Raider. <laughs> you know, so, you know, people have to do their homework before they put things out there. You know, and listen, I've been doing interviews 20, 25 years. I've made mistakes. I've put my foot in my mouth. Yeah. Okay. Sure. We all have. But, you know, I'm. Como se dice, yerba buena. You 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 age well, mm -hmm. right? And you you're able to like, oh shit, you know, I was wrong, mm -hmm. and I'm willing to admit that. You know, it's just who we are as humans. You know, as we get older, we we are supposed to become more intelligent, more wiser, mm -hmm. and you know, some of my friends have 
said some things that they wish they couldn't, <laughs> wish they didn't say. But you know, it's that's just who we are as humans. You know, as we make mistakes and you know we move forward and we do more research. Here's a final thought. I want to ask you a final question as we close. Right. Know that there's this big divide thing happening within hip hop, and how do we? How do we? But it's not. It's how do we fix this? It's not a divide within hip hop. Mm, okay. Side forces that are trying to divide hip hop, and they're using each other, each other, each of us mm. as pawns to do it. So how do we fix this? Uh, time will tell. Time will tell. You know, I'm frankly tired. I'm yeah. tired. I've been, a, I'm, I, the last week and a half, two weeks, I've been called a Latino, uh, a conquistador, um, uh, uh, a white supremacist, a you know, a clownzo. That's the new one, clownzo. Mm. By this group of 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 people that are trying to divide this culture up, and you know what? At the end of the day, I couldn't care less what you think about me, this, that, and the other. Because a, you're not paying my rent, you're not paying my mortgage, you're not paying for any of that. And you're not sleeping in my bed. Right. But at the what, end of the day, I, it, 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 what, it's sad. What I thought was funny was, and you brought this up to me when we talked, you said, you know, the whole thing with the images on the trailer and all that. And we don't, we don't need to name names, but like most of the original images that were there were from you, from Shalfant. From from the white devils, from the Latinos, the white devils, and the culture vultures, and yet you, you, you're doing a, a, a doc using my images, the white devils' images, this and and the other whatever you want to call them. It, it just it's ironic. It's sad. You're pushing this narrative and this agenda. But yet you're using my images. And you know what? You can take my images out. But you're still using the white devil's images. And now you're using AI-generated images? That's how desperate you are? Wow. Because some of those photographs are fucking incredible. <laughs> and, like, I know. They're almost. That, they're too perfect. Yeah. Too perfect. And so that's the AI. Because <laughs> they're AI images. Mm -hmm. Which is sad. Sad. So well, listen, listen, shout out to the pioneers. You know, my desire, Joe, again, is to bring us together. I know that's your desire. This is, we don't need this. And information coupled with inspiration is is powerful but we got to put the information out and we got to tell our story the information is out there mm. the information is out there mm. the images are out there the audio tapes are out there okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some of the pioneers and some of my friends who have who have said things in the past have corrected themselves because they're older now so the information is out there but if people choose to be selective in in choosing what information they want to use to support their narrative then shame on you mm -hmm. shame on you yeah you, you you're calling me all these names you're bullying you you're bullying me on 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 social media but if you do a deep dive into my family, I'm the last person <laughs> mm. that would be called a culture vulture or a Latino and 
you know, a colonizer and all of that. You know, my family literally gave their lives for black and brown, you know, decent, you know, you know, what they needed to live. You know, if you go to the Bronx right now, Prospect Avenue on your 56th Street, one corner is named after my mother, one corner is named after my grandmother. Felipe Luciano, that's my uncle. Mm. You know, Denise Oliver, you know, all these people from the Young Lords and this, that, and the other, you know, and you're going to call me a colonizer? Mm. Okay, at least I'm not doing a Kickstarter to, to do what I need to do to support my narrative. <laughs> Brother, listen, man. Thank you. First of all, where's yeah. Al? That's why I want to know. Yeah, yeah. Al, we, we, we're gonna do. I'm gonna speak to Al today after Let's I get talk off. Talk about Al. Give a uh, big shout out to Al Pizarro. Al yes. doesn't get the credit that he he should be getting. You know, he does a lot with Hip Hop Boulevard. Even before that, you know, his uh, record pool. Al is a pillar in 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 this community and in, in this hip hop community, and you know, and I love him to death. I love him to death. I I kid him all the time, mm. but um, shout out to Al Pizarro. Yeah, yeah, and guys that are watching, I know some of you, all of you, wanted to see the Al interview. I'm gonna work on that. We're gonna make that happen. So they got a younger a younger. Better looking guy than Al today. <laughs> right? Bro, thank you for for even doing this, for jumping in last minute, bro. And um, yeah, man. Just so we're gonna take any questions? No questions? No, because I can't read any of that stuff. <laughs> so that's why it, it, it's hard to read. So we're just gonna leave that, you know. Right. Can't read it, it's jumbled up. So um any final words from you? Just, you know what? Listen, at the end of the day, you know, uh, I'm going to quote my brother, my, we're, we're, I mean, my day one who has been there for me, Grandmaster Kaz, you know, hip hop didn't invent anything. It reinvented everything. And, you know, the culture itself does not discriminate and doesn't care where you're from, what color your skin is, this, that, and the other. But, you know, at this point in my life, if you're not 60 years or older or close to 60 and from the Bronx, you, 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 there's very few people. Okay, Rob Swift. Mm -hmm. Rob Swift. Great DJ, turntablist, the whole nine yards. This motherfucker does so much homework. Mm. That he gets an A plus, even though he wasn't from the Bronx or grew up during this time. He does his homework. Where is he from? Rob, I think is from Queens. Okay, yeah. And Rob, if you're listening or you see this, correct me if I'm wrong. But you know, he's part of the Executioners with Rock Raider. May he rest in peace. That whole group, and um, you know, he's on point. And there's few people that I would say that to. And, you know, again, if you're not from the Bronx or, or, or you know, from that era, I don't want to hear anything you got to say because all you're doing is repeating what you heard. Yeah. And I'm guilty of that, too, sometimes. Sure, we all are. Yeah. But as, I live there. As I we grew up there. Yeah, we live. You You can't question somebody's experience it, it's what we live yeah you can't the bronx you know the only borough attached to the mainland had many different you know the, the norwood section the soundview section this section this that everybody had their own little different experience mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and i can only speak on my experience and from my experience did we call each other's name Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when it came to scrapping <laughs> from another neighborhood, <laughs> we were all together. That's you right. know what I mean? And, you know, 
in my eyes, you know, everybody was inspired by somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't, it, nobody woke up one day and say, I'm going to be the first DJ. I'm going to be the first B-boy. I'm going to be the first graffiti writer. I'm going to be the first. There was inspiration somewhere along the line. You may be the first that everybody was talking about. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you were the first, you know, I did see you, you know, back in the days. But where have you been for the past 40 years? Now you want to stick your head up out of the sand and say, ah, but I was the first. Right. Kaz has a, a name for those people. Lion ears. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Coke Rock calls them the Lion Kings. There you go. Yeah. And I Bro love Coke. We hung out not too long ago and, you know, wealth of knowledge. Wealth, a wealth of knowledge. But, you know, he'll tell you, you know, the last poets inspired him. Felipe Luciano, you know, those guys. That's right. You know, and, you know. Yeah. It's just, hopefully, this will blow over and um, we can all live as one. That's right. And Brother, thank you. The hour's late. I'm old, and I need to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, I need to put my PJs back on, motherfucker. <laughs> bro, I appreciate you, bro. I'll, I'll call you this week. All right, we'll talk. I still want that book in the mail, and I got to get you mine. Yes, yes, yes. And to everybody, to 35-plus people watching, thank you for uh, listening to two old men speak on a Saturday night. <laughs> yes, sir. Brother. Peace. We'll talk. All right. Peace.